Do you feel that true crime matters? Winter is coming? Or just more cold cases that, God, I'm an idiot. Anyway, hi, hello, true crimers. This is another compilation video, and this is technically a part two to a previous compilation video I made on my coldest cases by state. I did this series over on TikTok. I went backwards alphabetically. So for the first video, I showed uh, Wyoming through Oklahoma. That was 15 videos. Today, I'm gonna do 20 videos. Uh, it's going to be Ohio through Kansas. Yeehaw! <laughs> so just a heads up, there, there are like several videos in a row where I was like every goddamn TikToker working with the coldest uh, water bottle, um, which is a wonderful water bottle, but several of these videos, I have little like promotional in intros to them. I'm going to try my best to edit them all out when I post this, but if you see any kind of like cringy shit that's still left behind, sorry! Gotta make that money, I guess. <laughs> I still, I believe, I actually only have two more states left in this series to actually cover, and that's Alaska and Alabama. So when I finish posting all of these compilations of the coldest cases, I will make a video on YouTube just finishing the two states in one video. Uh, real quick, if you want to purchase some merch from us, we have uh, a merch store in the link tree below, um, in the description below. Uh, you can also recommend cases to me um, by sending me an email, which will be listed below at Mikey at TrueCrimeRerd.com. Please make sure it's not already on my case list. You can look in the link tree and see if it's already there. So, without further ado, here are 20 more of the coldest cases by state. Viewer discretion is advised. Yeehaw. Mm -mm. Shiver me timbers, true crimerers. It is time for another episode of Coldest Cases by State. And today, we are on Ohio. Check the playlist below if you want to see more. And this is the Cleveland Torso Murderer. Viewer discretion is advised. On September 23rd, 1935, the decapitated remains of Edward Andrassy would be found. He was also emasculated. Near his remains would be the body of another man, also decapitated, also emasculated. He is still to this day referred to only as John Doe No. 1. Police would recover the heads of both men as well. January 26, 1936. The decapitated remains of Florence Genevieve would also be found. Her head would too be recovered. June 5th, John Doe No. 2, also known as the Tattooed Man. They determined that he was decapitated while he was still alive. Between July 22nd, 1936 and February 1937, the remains of two more John Doe's and one Jane Doe would be found. John Doe No. 4 and Jane Doe No. 1, their heads were never recovered. Bro, I think I just found the killer. You guys see this creepy ass dude? I'm sure those are glasses, right? His eyes aren't glowing. Ugh. June 6th, 1937, Jane Doe number two was found. Her head was recovered, but she was missing a rib. Her remains were primarily skeletal, as they believe she had been killed a year prior. Between April 1938 and August 1938, two more Jane Doe's and one more John Doe would be found. Jane Doe number three, her head was never recovered. Now, most of the victims were considered vagrants or uh, drifters. Like, none of them were ever really reported as missing. They had 12 confirmed bodies, but they suspect he killed up to 20 people. The M.O. was always the same. He would decapitate all of them. For about half of the victims, he would also sever their torso in half. All of the male victims were emasculated, meaning they had their manhood removed. The coroner would suspect that most of the decapitations were the actual cause of death. So that means they were alive when the process of the head cutting off was starting. And that is horrific. Given the surgical nature of these murders, they at one point believed that a doctor could have been doing this. In fact, they had a suspect who was a doctor. And that was a Dr. Francis Sweeney. He actually conducted amputations in the field during war, but there was never enough evidence to ever bring him to trial, and he died in 1964. It's also possible this was multiple killers, but the truth is, we'll never know. 
How do people just vanish and disappear off the face of the Earth? Well, they don't, but how are they never found? Hello, true crimers. It is time for another Coldest Cases by State, and today we're on North Dakota. This story takes us specifically to the city of Williston, North Dakota. Population of about 15,000 people. One of its population in 1981 was 15-year-old Barbara Cotton. Her friends and family described her as someone who is very caring, someone who's incredibly loyal to you. She was a great student in school, she never caused any problems, and she wasn't one to run away from home. On the evening of April 11th, 1981, Barbara would go ice skating with some of her friends. After that, they went to go eat at a local restaurant, which was inside the Plainsman Hotel. Her boyfriend was there with her as well, and when dinner was over, he offered to walk her home. But she said no, and she just wanted to do the short walk on her own. Several witnesses, including the people she was with, obviously, saw her outside of the Plainsman Hotel. And then other witnesses said they saw her walking through Recreation Park. And this was sometime around 11 o'clock that night. If the witnesses saw Barbara that night, then she would only have been a few blocks away from her home. And then, gone. She never made it home. She never got into contact with any of her friends. She left everything at home. She didn't pack a bag, so she didn't run away. And quite literally, that's basically it. She was just there one moment, and then she wasn't. Now, the most confusing part about this story is the boyfriend. Now, this person's name is Stacy Werder, and he was an alleged boyfriend of Barbara. His own family said that he possibly had issues with schizophrenia. There was an occasion where he almost strangled his own father to death with a cord. And then the recollection of other people who were there with Barb that night seems to be super foggy. Because then there were rumors that she was at a party later that night, and possibly Stacy was there with her. But no one can seem to recall. But all of this information about the party, about the possible boyfriend, all comes from her mother, Louise Cotton. She was apparently doing her own investigation. The boyfriend, Stacy, would go on to end his own life due to an unrelated thing. No one knows if the information the mother got was truly valid, and the whole thing is a hot mess. And somewhere in there is a missing 15-year-old girl. What happened to Barb Cotton? Hello, True Crimers. It is time for another episode of Coldest Cases by State. Now, today we're going to the little community of Pinehurst in North Carolina. In 1980, Robert and Evelyn Williams would retire and move to the Pinehurst community of North Carolina. The neighborhood they moved to was like right in the middle of a golf course. They both loved to golf. Sadly, towards the end of 1988, Robert would pass away from natural causes. Evelyn would continue to live in the home they shared. That is, until January 30th, 1989. Evelyn's next-door neighbor would say they saw her walking along the road sometime earlier that day. But then they hadn't seen anything from her the rest of the day, which was kind of unusual. So, concerned, the neighbors went over to her house. The garage door at the time was open, and inside, sadly, was the body of 72-year-old Evelyn Williams. Evelyn's throat had been cut open from ear to ear. The only thing they could determine that was missing was her pocketbook. But when authorities were beginning to investigate this, they didn't really look at this like a robbery. One of the explanations they gave is like, who walks up to someone and goes, hey lady, give me a, your pocketbook, and then just kills them in such a brutal and personal up-close way. So the theory is that this is someone who probably knew her in some capacity. Pinehurst at the time had maybe five, possibly 6,000 people living there. Now, also at the same time, Evelyn did have people working on her home, so there was a theory that possibly one of the construction people could have done this to her. But they never had any physical evidence to arrest anyone. There was no witnesses to say they saw a person running from the home. No one saw the attack happen. No one heard anything like a scream. Police said they had about a handful of suspects 
back in 1989. And that same amount of suspects was still kind of prevalent when they tried to reopen the case in 2016. They said that one of their primary suspects is actually already in prison for a very similar case, but they have not been able to physically tie him to the murder of Evelyn. Now we are over 30 years past since this occurred, with no one in handcuffs, no one in a jail cell, no one has been made responsible for the brutal murder of this innocent grandmother. I don't even have like a police sketch to share. There's like virtually nothing. And this is considered North Carolina's coldest case. Here's hoping that one day soon, Evelyn will get her justice. A local hero and legend in New York would be gunned down more than 20 years ago. And his family is still waiting for answers. Hello, true crimers. It is time for another Coldest Cases by State. Pictured here was Abe Liebelwall. He was the owner of the Second Avenue Deli in New York. Now, Abe, he was born in Ukraine in the early 1930s, and most of his young life was spent in terror. At one point, he and his family were exiled to Kazakhstan. They would then flee to Poland. And then he, along with a couple of family members, they survived the Holocaust. But many of his family were killed. He would then become a refugee in Italy. And then finally, in the early 50s, they would move to America. Abe worked hard for the American dream. He had worked at several different delis. And then in 1954, he finally opened his own. The Second Avenue Deli. It is world famous. It was hugely popular amongst the Jewish community, but really every New Yorker knew the Second Avenue Deli. It had been known for its delectable pastrami sandwiches. Now, not only did Abe cater to the rich and famous, here he is pictured with uh, Major League icon Mike Piazza. He catered to many celebrities, but Abe also fed the homeless. No questions asked. The absolute horrors he went through during the youth of his life, well, it developed a certain level of kindness in his heart, and he would never turn anyone down. For a long time, he did everything himself. He cleaned his own sidewalks, he cooked, he took orders, he served. Sadly, all of this would come to a very sudden end on March 4th, 1996. The 64-year-old Abe Liebelwall got into the Second Avenue Deli van and began driving just a few blocks down the road to make a deposit. When he got to the NatWest Bank, he stepped out of the van. Two men approached him and shot him three times, once in the head. They stole his deposit and his wallet and took off with roughly $10,000. Witnesses said the killers wasted no time, almost as if they knew he was going to be there. The two assailants fled. Abe was able to crawl to the sidewalk where he was heard saying, they shot me, and then he died right there. Witnesses would work together to come up with this composite drawing of one of the men. A couple of days later, the gun was found, and that gun was also linked to another unsolved double homicide. They also found the empty bag that had the cash and Abe's wallet. But this man and the other man have never been caught. And a man who survived the Holocaust would be gunned down by two cowards and his family just wants them to be caught. Yes, the deli is still open. Hello, true crimers. It is time for another Coldest Cases by State, and today we're going to New Mexico. Technically, the most prolific cold case in New Mexico right now is the West Mesa Bone Collector, but I already covered that case. So this is the case of Teal Piddington. Viewer discretion is advised. Teal lived most of her life in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and uh, she was actually going to the Vogue College of Cosmetology at the time of this case. In the summer of 1984, Teal was living with her, at the time, boyfriend. His name was Marion Owen Gent. Now, Marion had an ex-girlfriend, and her name was Tamara Britton. And nine days before the case of Teal Piddington, Tamara disappeared. And to this day, she's never been found. But nine days after her disappearance, Teal Piddington also disappeared. She was scheduled to work at a local pizza shop one summer evening in 1984, but she never showed up. According to the manager at the pizza place she worked at, I guess they suspected Teal of dealing drugs, specifically marijuana, but I don't know how truthful that is. Men were constantly looking at her, hitting on her, 
and that included Marion Gent, who she lived with. When Teal disappeared, they actually gave Marion a polygraph test, and he passed twice, meaning that he did not know where she was and he had nothing to do with her disappearance. Several months later, in this culvert here, a body would be discovered. The body was so badly decomposed, they had to use dental records in order to identify the person. And the person would turn out to be Teal Piddington. The medical examiner said it was evident that she had been sexually assaulted and then was strangled with her own underwear. So police again would interrogate Marion, but again, they had nothing. They got nothing from him. Is it just merely coincidence that two women that he knew personally disappeared within the same two weeks? Police also suspected a serial killer from New Mexico. His name was David Bruce Morton, and he killed a few women in the 80s, and he fit the M.O. of what happened to Teal. But they've never been able to pin anything on him with her murder, or the disappearance of the other girl. And he was convicted of at least two murders beforehand but he was out when Teal disappeared. The cold case team in 2018 tried to contact Marion again, but he declined to talk to them. And in 2020, he passed away. And her murder with very few leads, very little evidence, is still unsolved. Hello, true crimeers. It's time for the next coldest cases by state. We are going to New Jersey. Viewer discretion is advised. Pictured here was 72-year-old Gertrude Bizarro of Clifton, New Jersey. And her and her husband, they lived here in this home on Cisco Place. On December 18th, 2001, while her husband was at work, Gertrude was in the house alone. The Clifton, New Jersey Police Department believes that at some point in the afternoon, a burglar or multiple burglars broke into her home, not thinking anyone was there. They then quickly realized that Gertrude was in fact in the house and that some sort of altercation took place. And during whatever struggle may have happened, Gertrude was killed. Once Gertrude's body was discovered by her family, the police arrived. In the home, they did find signs of a struggle, but that was about it. They don't really have any fingerprints left behind. Now, apparently there was some unknown DNA left behind at the crime scene, but it doesn't match anyone in the home, including Gertrude. I don't know in what capacity the DNA was left, however, if it was blood or anything else, but the police department has held on to that. And over the years, they've been trying to retest it to see if it matches anyone in their system. In terms of suspects, there's been only a few, really. During that exact same time frame, there was a group of teenagers going through the neighborhood, breaking into homes and stealing little things here and there. They, of course, have been considered suspects in this case, and to my knowledge, the Clifton Police Department still considers them suspects now. They also suspected a man who was a burglar, but also a peeping Tom, um, who has since now been in jail. But again, he has no direct ties to this case as of yet. Police have interviewed well more than 200 suspects and witnesses to this crime, but again, they've got almost nothing. In an article I read, they've even had suspects who are now down in Florida. They've actually interviewed people up and down the East Coast. So they've really put their due diligence into this, trying to solve this murder. If you by chance have any information about this case, you can even report it anonymously. You can contact the Clifton, New Jersey Police Department. You can call 973-470-5908 or the Passaic County Prosecutor's Office at 973-881-4800. Somebody has to know something. Criminals always talk about things they've done. It's always said that they have a very hard time shutting up. So someone's probably admitted to this. And if you know, you can help this family get closure. Hello, true crimers. It is time for another Coldest Cases by State, and today we're going to New Hampshire. So this is the case of the Connecticut River Killer. Viewer discretion is advised. On October 25th, 1978, the body of 27-year-old Kathy Milliken would be found. Her body was discovered at the Chandler Brook Wetland Preserve in New Hampshire. She had been stabbed 29 times. But there was such little evidence that police had nothing to go on. 
so it quickly went cold. July 25, 1981, 37-year-old Mary Elizabeth Critchley would go missing. She disappeared in Vermont, but, but a few weeks later in August, her body was found in New Hampshire, just discarded in a wooded area. Her body was so badly decomposed, however, that they were not able to determine her cause of death. But again, very little evidence. Case goes cold. May 30th, 1984. Bernice Countermanche, who's only 17 years old, she allegedly had gone hitchhiking to meet up with her boyfriend, but she never got to where she was supposed to go. And she, too, would go missing. It wouldn't be until two years later that her body was discovered. And this was near the Connecticut River. She had been killed by several stab wounds. July 22, 1984, 27-year-old Ellen Freed, after a work shift, she went to a payphone to speak to her sister. On this phone call, she was concerned about an unusual car driving back and forth. And then, the next day, Ellen didn't show up to work, and she was reported missing. Sadly, her body was found in September of 1985. Also left near the river, she too was stabbed. July 10th, 1985, 27-year-old Eva Morse. She was last seen hitchhiking in New Hampshire, and then she too would vanish. Her body was found in 1986, very close to where the second victim's body was left. April 15th, 1986, 36-year-old Linda Moore. Now, she lived in Vermont. That night when her husband got home, he found her stabbed to death inside. January 10th, 1987, 38-year-old Barbara Agnew. She also lived in Vermont, but she would also suddenly disappear. March of 1987, her body was found. She was also stabbed to death. On August 6, 1988, Jane Borowski, she was attacked and yanked from her car by a man. She was pregnant, and he stabbed her 27 times and left her for dead, but she survived. So did the baby. She would give these composite drawings, but the man has never been caught. And this case is ice cold. Ooh, it's chilly. That was stupid. Hello, true crimers. It is time for another episode of Coldest Cases by State. And today we're going to Nevada. Nevada? Nevada. Nevada. So this is the case of Zona Stroud. And honestly, I don't have a lot of information because they've released very little details about this. But this is considered the oldest cold case in the state as of now. So, on April 3rd, 1960, two individuals came across what appeared to be a body sitting underneath a tree. And this was between Reno and Virginia City in Nevada. She was dressed in all black clothing, black shirt, black pants, black shoes. Some have described it as almost like a, a ski suit, like she would have been skiing. But I don't know if you do that in that state. <laughs> Now, with her, she also had a pink sweater. Now, another interesting feature about her, especially for 1960s, it's not very common to be very tattooed, but she was. Uh, apparently, she had a lot of them. Now, one of the reasons why this case is so cold, more than likely, is because there was nothing left behind. There was nothing else next to her body. There were no shoe impressions um, in the dirt near her. They didn't know what DNA even was in 1960, so nothing like that was even collected. There were no fingerprints. The only way they were able to identify her is through her fingerprints. And the only reason that worked is because she had been arrested before. But once they found out who she was, Zona Stroud, or she also went by Sona, I guess, like they interviewed the people in her life, her family, and there were no known enemies. It doesn't seem like there was any like jilted lovers, but it's always noted that strangulation is one of the most personal ways that you can end someone's life. And typically the people who do that are people that know the victim. But here we are, 62 years later almost, and they are literally no closer to knowing who killed her, how she got there, the motive behind her murder. All they really have is a photo of Zona. These are the ones that I feel hurt the most because there is likely no chance now that this will ever be solved. I mean, just like face the reality of it and that's that sucks it's grim 
a life was taken and the person who did it, it they got away with it but hopefully they are in prison for other crimes that unfortunately they committed but we'll never know chicka chicka boom boom true crime bears what 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 was that oh you're such an idiot mike anyway hello true crime bears it's time for another coldest cases by state today we're going to nebraska and this is the case of patricia carol webb viewer discretion is advised patricia was a 24 year old living in lincoln her mother described her as a very compassionate, very loving, very understanding person. She was extremely popular. She loved to roller skate. In fact, she won competitions for it. Now, based on how she was described and just based on how like wholesome she looks, I'm kind of surprised by this next part. She was an employee of an adult book and movie store. Yeah, she sold uh, corn, as they say on this app. On April 18th, 1974, she was working a late shift. However, she never got home after her shift. And when the staff came in the following morning, she was gone, the door was unlocked and opened. Her friends, her family, no one had heard from her. She went to work and then she just vanished. That is until two days later. A cattle rancher would find a body underneath this haystack. When police arrived, it would be confirmed that it was the body of Patricia Webb. She had six gunshots to her head and four to her body. She was nude except for a very puffy jacket laying on top of her. Their first instinct when they saw her body was, this appears to have been an execution. But why? Why would someone go after this young woman and execute her? There were things stolen from the corn shop. So it could have been a burglary gone horribly wrong. But here's another fun fact about Patricia. She was also a drug informant for Lincoln Police. How she got into that role, I actually don't know. The day she was supposed to testify in court about one of the uh, drug cases is also the day she disappeared and was eventually murdered. Witnesses said they think they saw an African-American man leaving the corn shop with her at around 1 a.m. that morning and got into the car with another man, a white man, but they've never been identified. And they don't even know if it was actually Patricia leaving with them. Now at the time, corn shops and feeders were heavily involved with the mafia. So the fact that she appeared to be killed execution style by a rifle, by the way, could lead to maybe this was a mafia hit, but why her? They ruled out any kind of sexual motive because there was actually no signs of her being sexually assaulted. They think she was killed somewhere else and left at the haystack. But by who? Sadly, that still remains a mystery. <laughs> Hello, Drew Kramers! That was the lamest opening of all time. It's time for another Coldest Cases by State. You darn tootin' it is. Today, we're going to Montana. Do they have an accent? I don't know. And this is the case of Father John Kerrigan. Oh, bless me, Father, for I may have sinned. And you may have as well. Who knows? Around July 15th, 1984, Father John Kerrigan had got to his new church. And that was the Sacred Heart Catholic Church in Ronan, Montana. Ronan or Ronan? You'll tell me. This was going to be the home he lived in while he was the new priest. But four days after he arrived, Father Kerrigan would disappear. The last time anyone saw Father Kerrigan alive was on July 20th, 1984, at a bakery across the street from the home slash church he was staying at. The 58-year-old priest said hello and conversated with a few parishioners. He would tell them, all right, I'm going to bed now. This was around 11 p.m. that night, but then after that, no one ever saw him again. A couple of days after he disappeared, right here along this stretch of road, a pile of clothing was found, and that clothing had blood on it. That clothing, it was confirmed to belong to Father John Kerrigan. Next to that pile of clothing was a bloodied coat hanger. Police would speculate that the hanger was used to restrain Father Kerrigan. On July 29th, about five miles away from where the clothing was found, they discovered his vehicle parked next to these radio towers. His 1976 Chevy Impala had blood all over it. 
The keys were found inside, and when they opened the trunk, they found a bloodied shovel, a bloody pillow, and his wallet. His wallet had tons of cash in it, so they thought, nope, this was not a robbery. This was a targeted attack against him specifically. There were rumors that Father Kerrigan's disappearance and probable murder was linked to another priest in New Mexico who was murdered. In August of 1982, Father Reynaldo Rivera was murdered in New Mexico. His car was also found several miles away from where his body was found. It did not appear that he had been robbed. Again, it appeared to be a targeted attack. However, to this day, they have never been able to officially connect both cases. Father Kerrigan or his body have never been found. Interestingly enough, he was friends with another priest by the name of James Otis Anderson, who also disappeared in Montana in 1982. In 2015, the Roman Catholic Diocese released a list, a list of priests who were involved in sexually assaulting children. Father Kerrigan was on that list. Was this revenge? Was it vigilanteism? To this day, it's unsolved. This was the final resting place of a young girl brutally murdered in St. Louis. And to this very day, no one knows who she was. Hello, true crimerers. This is another Coldest Cases by State. And today, we're going to Missouri. And it is the case of little Jane Doe. Viewer discretion is advised. This was an abandoned apartment building on Clemens Street in St. Louis, Missouri. By 1983, this building had been completely abandoned. It was in complete shambles and in disarray, and people would use it as like a squatting place. On February 28th, 1983, two looters would enter the building and start searching for things when they came across something absolutely horrific. Down in the basement, they found the headless body of what they thought was a smaller woman. She was lying flat on her stomach, and all she had on was a sweater, and her hands were tied behind her back. She was nude from the waist down. And this is the rope that was used to bind her. Now, originally, police suspected that this was probably some sort of lady of the night, just given kind of what the building may have been used for since it was abandoned. But it turns out it was actually the body of a very young girl. They knew this because the body hadn't gone through puberty yet. So they determined that she was likely between the ages of 8 and 11. She was an African-American girl, um, and it did appear that she had been sexually assaulted as well. Now, there were no pools of blood anywhere in this building, so they did come to the conclusion that she was likely killed somewhere else, and this building was just used as a dumping site. They were able to determine that she had been killed probably five to six days prior to her being found. And unfortunately, her head has never been found. They combed for evidence around the building, but they really just didn't find anything of use. They went through a list of recent missing girls throughout the state surrounding the area, as well as Missouri, but none of them matched the description of who this girl would have been. No one has ever come forward to say, that might be my missing child. No one's come forward at all. Ten months later, she was buried with, you know, only a couple people there. And her identity is still unknown. And her killer also still unknown. There has really been no, like, significant suspects. But, you know, technology these days, you never know. But for now, this case is still very much unsolved. Put on your fluffiest winter coat and hello, true crimers. It's time for another Coldest Cases by State. And today, we are going to M-I-S-S-I-S-S-I-P-P-I. Miss Peepee. -pee. No. Mr. Shippey, viewer discretion is advised. On the afternoon of August 4th, 2009, along Mississippi Highway 13, a motorist would come across a truck on fire. They alerted authorities, of course. Police and fire arrived. They put out the fire, and they noticed that the truck was also shot up with a whole bunch of bullets. Doing a quick little check, they uncovered who the truck belonged to. That would be 44-year-old Willie Flint Lee, and he was actually a volunteer firefighter. But 
Flint, as he would go by, was nowhere near his vehicle. There was no human remains inside the truck. Flint was just gone. So where the hell is he? What the hell happened? Well, that would not take long to sort of find out, because the very next day, floating down the Strong River, a couple of miles or so away from where his truck was found, the deceased body of Flint would be uncovered. He had a single gunshot wound directly to his chest. Based on where it hit, uh, the coroner would state that he likely died immediately, and then was just thrown over an overpass where his truck was, and then whoever did it set his truck on fire. Now, I don't have any photos that I can confirm are the suspects, so unfortunately I, don't, I can't show that to you. So here's another picture of Flint. A man by the name of Christopher Hubbard would come forward to police and essentially confess to the murder. He also suggested that another man named Roger Gilbert was involved, as well as a third person who was not named. So those two men, they were indicted, and they were about to go to trial for this. But then Mr. Hubbard would recant his confession, and police, they had no physical evidence to connect them to this crime. Like, literally nothing. As a matter of fact, there really was no evidence that would connect to anyone. They also considered another man by the name of Charles Earl. He was actually the brother-in-law of Flint's wife. Charles had apparently been going around town saying some pretty awful shit about uh, Flint. But police were able to clear him, for the most part. And unfortunately, that's it. There, there is no more to go on. The fact that Christopher Hubbard confessed and named someone else definitely implies that they're guilty. But the police, their hands are tied. There's nothing they can do. So unfortunately, this case is still unsolved. Hello, everybody. Put on your jackets, your mittens, your scarves, and your long john underoos. It's time for another Coldest Cases by State, and today we're going to Minnesota. You betcha. And this is the case of Mary Schlaes. Viewer discretion, it's advised. It's also strongly advised that I stop doing that accent immediately. Mary was a delightful young woman who lived in Minneapolis, Minnesota. She was a 25-year-old University of Michigan student who was going for her master's degree. She loved art. She loved riding horses. She also spoke multiple different languages. She was just a very accomplished young woman, and she was well on her way to a very successful life. On the morning of February 15, 1974, Mary would leave her home in Minneapolis on her way to Chicago because she was going to an art gallery. Mary did not have a vehicle, and she was accustomed to hitchhiking for rides. Remember, folks, this is the 70s. Times were a lot different back then. Approximately three hours later, a witness named Dennis Anderson would say he saw a compact vehicle on the side of the road, and this was near Springbrook Township. In the vehicle, he said he saw a man and a woman arguing. A little bit later, the witness would then come back the other way, and he now saw a man dumping what appeared to be a body down the same side of the road. The witness would then wait for the vehicle to leave, and when he went to check on what the individual dropped down the side of the road, well, it, it was a body. He would obviously contact police, and then police would arrive, and eventually the body would be identified as 25-year-old Mary Schlaes. She had been stabbed 15 times. The body was found roughly 90 miles away from where she was last seen alive. None of her belongings, like her purse, were there with her. There's a face. The witness would give a description of the man he saw with the woman earlier, and this is the composite drawing they came up with. Always terrifying. Police would search the home of Mary Schlaes, and they found a photo of an unidentified man who looked very similar to the composite drawing. This man, however, has never been identified, and he is considered a person of interest. Another person of interest is this fella, serial killer Randall Woodfield, a man who used to play in the NFL for the Green Bay Packers. It's believed he killed up to 40 different people. He was only ever charged and convicted of one murder, but he was known to be in the area where Mary Schlaes was found at that time. But no evidence has ever linked him to her. And this guy, 
This guy, all unidentified. Who killed Mary? Hello, true crimers. It is time for another Coldest Cases by State. And today, we're going to Michigan. Viewer discretion is advised. This lovely lady here was 48-year-old mother Gail Webster of Troy, Michigan. She lived here at the Troy Somerset Apartments. On October 28, 1978, her 25-year-old daughter went to go check on her. When she got there, she noticed that the door to the apartment was not locked. She walks into the apartment and she discovers her mother. Gail was a beloved woman in the community. She was a manager at a nearby restaurant. She had no sordid history. She was never into drugs or drinking. She never fell into the wrong crowd. She was just a really well-liked and wonderful mother. Gail had been bludgeoned to death and there was just blood everywhere. This was just a savage beating and there was no apparent sexual assault involved. So whoever would have done something like this to her, it kind of almost sounds like they knew her. As a matter of fact, there was nothing wrong with her apartment. Nothing was out of place. There was no sign of a struggle. Nothing was stolen. They did find some bloody rags in the sink, but again, this is 1978, so DNA testing wasn't even around. Now, they did collect all of this stuff, and they still have it. But back then, not knowing, you know, what DNA would end up being, a lot of this stuff may not have been preserved perfectly. But again, they still have it. They looked into Gail's past, especially her relationships, her ex-husband, her ex-boyfriend, and the boyfriend she had at the time. All three men were given polygraph tests, and allegedly all of them passed. All of them were investigated and essentially cleared. They weren't ruled out completely, but again, you know, evidence it was very different back then than it is now. So police are saying that it is still possible one of the three could have done this, but unfortunately, all three of those men have since passed away. You know, there was no witnesses who saw anyone unusual, which means there was no composite drawings made. You know, back then, this was literally just a random murder for what appears to be no reason. You know, to me, just in my experience about talking about all this stuff, and I'm by no means, you know, a detective or an expert, but to me, it just sounds like someone she knew did this to her. No forced entry, nothing stolen, no sexual assault. To me, it, it sounds like one of those three men got into an argument with her and they did what they did. But can that ever be proven at this point? Unfortunately, that's unknown and her case is still unsolved. Hello, true crimers. It is time for another Coldest Cases by State. Today, we're going to Massachusetts. Get in the car. That was offensive. I will never do that again. This is the case of Brenda Lacombe. Viewer discretion is advised. 19-year-old Brenda lived here in the city of Lowell, Massachusetts. Brenda was described as a good sister, a good dancer, a good person. As a teenager, she lived a fast life and she loved to party. Um, but the birth of her son seemed to kind of slow that down a bit. On the night of May 15th, 1982, Brenda had originally had plans to go on a double date with her sister. But for whatever reason, the plans fell through. And so she went to her grandmother's apartment. And that was here at the Francis Gatehouse Mill Apartments. She was hanging out there with her grandma. She drank a couple of glasses of wine and she was there until somewhere around midnight. Now, before Brenda left her grandmother's apartment, Brenda made a phone call. Who Brenda called that night is still unknown, but that would be the last time anyone saw Brenda alive again. Brenda never made it home that night. She never got back to her son, Matthew. No one ever heard from her again. So she was quickly reported missing and police began searching and they would find her. On June 4th, 1982, in the town of Harvard, Massachusetts, next to this wall of rocks, they found the body of Brenda Lacombe. The only thing police have said that the type of death was homicide, but her cause of death has never been revealed. And they've likely 
kept that secret so that in case they ever do have a suspect that they're questioning, in case that suspect slips up, you know, they'll know they have the right person. The entire case seems to come down to who did Brenda talk to on the phone that night at her grandma's house. Her grandmother didn't know. I don't believe they were able to find out what number she dialed, but it is very likely that the person she called is maybe someone she met up with that night. And that person was likely the one who killed her. And it is now 40 years later and police still do not have any inkling as to what happened to Brenda Lacombe that night and who took her life. I don't know if they questioned or investigated the father of her baby. That information is not public. But at this point, I have to believe that they've never been able to accuse anyone, including any ex-boyfriends or any men in her life. Because again, 40 years later and there's no suspect, so... If you have any information about what happened to Brenda Lacombe that night, please reach out to the number I put on the screen. You just never know. Hello, true crimers. It is summertime, so let's cool off with another Coldest Cases by Stage. That was the dumbest thing I've ever said. Today, we're going to Maryland. And this is the case of Carolyn Wasilewski. Viewer discretion is advised. Believe it or not, Carolyn was actually just a 14-year-old girl, even though she looks much older. This was actually pretty common in her life. People would confuse her for being someone in her late 20s or maybe possibly her mid-30s. She looked and acted a lot more mature than her age actually was. She lived in the Baltimore area and she went to Southern High School. She was the oldest of seven children. And apparently she ran with a gang or a group of people called the Drapes. But really they would just do like little petty crimes. Nothing like major. In the early evening of November 8th, 1954, sometime around 6.15 p.m., she would leave her house because she was supposed to go meet her friend Peggy. Uh, and they were going to be going to the local elementary school to sign up for a, uh, a dance contest. She would say goodbye to her family and then she would never be seen alive again. She was expected home sometime around, you know, nine or 10 o'clock, but she never got there. And once her parents realized that something was wrong, they went out looking for her that very night, but they came up with nothing. 7 a.m. the following morning, a train conductor would make a gruesome discovery. There was a body lying on the train tracks. It would be identified as Carolyn. She was only partially clothed and uh, she had like a little a message written on her thigh. Well, not really a message, it was a name, the name Paul. And that was written in lipstick. Her cause of death was she had a severe skull fracture. Due to the lack of blood at the train tracks, they believed that she was killed somewhere else. And that theory would prove to be true just a few hours later. In a vacant parking lot nearby, they discovered uh, a little pool of blood. They also discovered Carolyn's belongings like her purse. Police began to investigate right away. They were looking for other members of this Drapes gang, but nothing ever came from that particular part of the investigation. Then they discovered the identity of a man by the name of Ralph Garrett, someone who was seen speaking to Carolyn that night. So he was wanted for questioning, but sadly, he hanged himself, and he did so just near where the train tracks were that Carolyn was found. Carolyn's killer left virtually no evidence, and back in 1954, there were a lot of things they didn't know they probably were supposed to collect. Who is this Paul person? Was that just written on her thigh to throw off the investigation? But police have gotten nowhere on her case, and it's still very much unsolved. Hello, true crimers. It is time for another Coldest Cases by State. Today, we're going to Maine. Viewer discretion is advised. Today's story takes us to the little seaside town of Agunquit, Maine. The date, August 9th, 1970. And pictured here was 13-year-old Mary Catherine Olinshuk. The family was there visiting their summer home. Sometime that afternoon, Mary asked her mom if she could bike ride into town so she can go purchase some candy. And her mom said, yes, absolutely, go for it. At some point during her bike ride, a witness would say that Mary was sitting outside of the Lookout Hotel. The witness had stated that Mary had stopped and talked to a man in a 1967 maroon Chevy vehicle. And that's a guess, that's not a definitive. 
The man appeared to be in his 30s. He was dressed in dark clothes, and the witness stated that he was not a hippie. The witness then stated that she saw Mary get into the vehicle with this unknown man, and she left the bicycle right there by the hotel. Judging by body language, it appeared that Mary knew who this man was. And then, Mary never came home that night. The family would report her missing to the police, but they did not make the story public for about two days because they were kind of anticipating some sort of ransom call. You see, Mary's father was in the army, and he was involved in a government project called CHASE, which stood for Cut Holes and Sink em. This was a program about dumping rockets into the ocean. So there was this thought that maybe she was kidnapped by someone who opposed this, but no one ever called, no one ever sent a note. So then this became public, which is when the witness would come forward. And that's when they found the bicycle that Mary had actually borrowed from a neighbor, and it was just sort of leaning against the wall of the hotel. So the search became a lot larger at that point. They even had clairvoyance come forward to say, oh, she's still here in the state. Green Berets got involved for searching for Mary. It was an all-hands-on-deck operation. Thirteen days after she disappeared, she was found. Inside this barn in nearby Kennebunk, Maine, Mary's decomposed body was discovered and she had a rope around her neck. She was not sexually assaulted. The interesting thing is, is that a clairvoyant actually did predict she would be found in Kennenchunk. Kind of weird. It's actually the same clairvoyant who helped with the Boston Strangler case. On the night of the murder, there were some teenage boys inside the barn. They heard a lot of rustling coming from the nearby woods. And that was about 1.30 in the morning. A couple hours later, they heard a car starting and driving away. Those boys, by the way, were never considered suspects. Both of Mary's parents have since passed away. There's very little evidence, and this case is still very, very cold. Hello, true crimers. It is time for another Coldest Cases by State. And today, we are going to Louisiana. Viewer discretion is advised. Between 2005 and 2008, the bodies of eight women would be found in various locations. Whether that be dumped on the side of the road, or possibly near a canal or river. Some were found floating in swamps, but body after body would keep showing up. The eight victims would be Loretta Lewis, Ernestine Patterson, Kristen Lopez, Whitney Dubois, Laconia Brown, Crystal Zeno, Brittany Gary, and Nicole Gilroy. They would become known as the Jeff Davis Eight or the Jennings Eight. This primarily happened in the Jefferson Davis Parish area, and the Jennings Police Department is the ones who were first initially handling this. Now, all eight victims were sex workers. At first, people were considering this to be some sort of serial killer. But experts, once the FBI got involved essentially, would say that serial killers don't tend to kill people who are associated with one another. And the thing about these eight women is they all knew each other. They all worked together. Some of them were even physically related to one another. So some people believe that this is the work of several killers and probably not one serial killer. But this case has been swamped in controversy and it's, it's, it's a hot mess. <laughs> you see, all eight women were also informants for the police. Initially, they were all drug informants. But then once the women started dying one after another, some of them were becoming informants or witnesses for the previous murders, and then they would end up dead. Some of the victims were kind of tangled within the lives of the police officers. Some of the suspects that police had were also sort of tangled with the police officers and with the victims. The few suspects they've had have been specifically towards only like one of the killings, not all of them. But then they never had enough evidence or evidence wasn't collected correctly. So none of those suspects were ever able to be charged with anything. And then a lot of people believe that police themselves may be suspects. Some of these women and witnesses outside of these women said that police were going to kill me or going to kill her. One of them said that there was three cops who wanted to kill her and then she ends up dead. There was even a political official, like a mayor, who had connections to possibly one or two of these women at, you know, seedy hotels, you know, paying for their services. 
But as it stands right now, none of their murders have been solved. It is a jumbled, disgusting mess. And it seems to be impossible to know who is on whose side here. Will they ever be solved? Hello, true crimers. It is time for another Coldest Cases by State. Today, we're going to Kentucky. Viewer discretion is advised. The murder of Betty Gail Brown, who was a Transylvania University student, is considered the oldest cold case in Kentucky. Betty, who was a sophomore at the school, was described as a very charismatic, very intelligent person. She seemed to always be happy and bubbly and just a joy to all of her friends and family. In the late evening hours of October 27, 1961, Betty's vehicle was found parked just outside the school. Betty was inside. She was found slumped back in the driver's seat with her bra around her neck. She had been strangled to death and they determined that it was her bra that was the murder weapon. Immediately, police and her family and friends wondered who on earth would want to kill the 19-year-old. She had no enemies. She didn't like not get along with any students. There was no known arguments she had with anyone. There weren't any jilted exes in her life. So this appeared to be a very random murder. Typically something you would see with possibly a serial killer, or maybe a robbery gone wrong, but nothing appeared to have been stolen from her. No one witnessed the attack, no one came forward to say they heard screaming or an altercation taking place. Earlier in the evening, some people at a diner said they believed they saw Betty with another female at the diner. But then once other people who were at the diner that same night at the same time said, we don't recall seeing Betty at all, that basically ended that portion of the investigation as to who this mysterious woman may have been. The case went cold, like immediately. Police had absolutely no idea who did this. There was very little evidence left behind, no fingerprints, no DNA, of course, because this was 1961, they had no idea what DNA even was. Police questioned every single male on campus, including teachers, but they were able to rule all of them out. Five years later, this man here, Alex Arnold Jr., would confess to killing Betty. He claims to have been in the area that night, and he claims to have been looking for a place to sleep. You see, at that time, he was a drunk, like a very, very serious alcoholic. He was always drunk. He said he approached Betty's car and saw her with another girl making out, which surprises everyone because, you know, back then being gay was like, you were vilified, but there was never any indication that Betty was in a lesbian relationship. He said they laughed and cussed at him, so he came back later to attack him and then strangled Betty to death and her friend ran away. This woman has never come forward. He was tried for the murder, but his trial ended in a hung jury and he was never retried either. In the end, police just didn't have any physical evidence to actually connect him to the murder, and he would later go on to recant his entire confession saying, I was a drunk. They also determined that every piece of information he gave them about the murder was all in the newspaper that he could have read all about over the five years that he waited to confess. The only thing that was mysterious about this confession is the woman that he claimed to see Betty with, which potentially tied back to the witness who may have seen Betty at the diner with another woman, but again, that story was, you know, never corroborated. After his initial confession, he would go on to profess his innocence just over and over again. And it's honestly pretty widely believed that he actually was not responsible for her murder. There was also the possibility that she was killed by a serial killer. His name was Nolan Ray George, and he actually sexually assaulted women and killed them by strangling them, usually, with articles of their own clothing. He did so in states like Kentucky, Ohio, but Betty was not sexually assaulted, which was one of his biggest MOs. And they also really couldn't place him in the area during that time. So ultimately, he would be ruled out, but he is in prison for the rest of his life for the other murders he committed. And now we're here 60 years later, and her murder is still very much unsolved. Shiver off all of your Galdern timbers, true crimeers. It is time for another Coldest Cases by State. Today, we are going to Kansas. 
This is the cold case of Kelly Lynn Albright. Viewer discretion is advised. Today's story takes place in Hutchinson, Kansas. Kelly Albright was born in Hutchinson, Kansas on May 17, 1958. Her family would say that Kelly was a beautiful young girl with an extremely bright future ahead of her. She loved swimming, she loved swinging on the swing set in her backyard, she just loved life. In the very late evening hours of September 17th, 1970, Kelly would vanish from her home. The following morning, when they realized Kelly wasn't there, they asked the brother who shared a room with her if they heard anything, and he didn't. By all accounts, it just appeared that an unknown person either entered the room through the bedroom or possibly even through the house itself. Kelly was reported missing immediately, and the search, along with police, would begin right away. They scoured the entire area, they looked around the entire neighborhood, they searched every nook and cranny of the house, the neighbors' houses, but nothing. That is until four days later. A pair of farmers who were working in a nearby field would come across the body of 12-year-old Kelly Lynn Albright. She had been stabbed 18 times. She was also sexually assaulted and then just left like garbage in the middle of a field. There was very little physical evidence tied to this case. There was no suspicious fingerprints left behind. It also didn't appear there was any actual forced entry. And given the fact that the brother didn't wake up to any kind of altercation taking place, as really did no one else in the house, could it be possible that whoever took her likely knew her, someone she may have been comfortable with. The family had a close friend by the name of Glenn Davis. I cannot find a confirmed photo of him. A neighbor would report seeing the vehicle of Glenn Davis parked just outside the home around the window of time that Kelly disappeared. He was also seen giving his own vehicle a very deep clean just a day after she disappeared but police had no physical evidence to connect him to it. They had no means to get a warrant. In 1995, he went to prison for incest. Incest with a child family member. So, police now wanted to question him with regards to the Albright case. But, he died in prison in 1997. The family also suspects possibly other family members might be involved. But sadly, this is still unsolved. 